Yeah, you know, on on that talking point, when you look at the Railroad Commission and what you guys have to do, you know, you have a lot to take into consideration, both from an environmental standpoint and an economic perspective as well. And the hot topic has been, you know, natural gas flaring. <laughs> and, you know, this is this is the hot the hot button issue. Everyone's talking about it. You know, how do you think about flaring in terms of, okay, you know, the economic impact that it can have on whether we restrict it or we permit it, um, the environmental impact that it has on uh, carbon dioxide and, um, you know, essentially wasting natural resources. I mean, it just like blows me away, you know, Mm -hmm. when you drive out into the Permian and there's just flares everywhere, just burning off resources. You know, how do you think about handling those situations? And I know this is a loaded question and it's the question that everyone wants to know, but I think about it a lot too, because it's not just a black and white binary answer. There's, there's impacts both to the environment and the economic, um, situation of Texas. So I think that's a great question. I mean, and it is, it's, it's a big thing on what this race is being run on this year. It seems to be have all the public's attention, but you know, let's just, let's kind of categorize that number one. When you talk about flaring, is have can you tell me of any exact research that really says that flaring is actually harming our atmosphere, and any worse than emissions from a car or anything else that they they're they're claiming is making changes to our climate that we we see today. Yeah, I mean, I personally can't point to yeah, any research. I know that there's a lot of documents out there, but nobody's proven to me exactly in pinpoint what, what is really hurting our atmosphere. And being an environmentalist all my life, you know, what I, what I do know about our Earth is we have evolved and we continue to evolve. And I can tell you that summers are going to get hotter, whether we had flaring or we had cars, because Earth is evolving. And we, we, we've done that. We've proven that we've evolved. So, you know, I'm not sure where the blame lies there. But when you talk about trying to curb flaring, you're, you're, you're really kind of a double-edged sword here. You know, um, if we said, okay, today Railroad Commission announces that we're never going to issue another flaring permit um, because we think it's hurting the atmosphere, well, we, we've just hurt the consumer. And you're asking, mm-hmm. well, why, how, how does that hurt the consumer? Well, you know, Today's technology and flaring is the best that is available on the market. And and I can tell you, the oil and gas industry from the environmental side, those guys don't only strive to look for technology, but the last thing they want to do is take gas and burn it off in the atmosphere. They want that gas to be turned to cash. Yeah. So when I I talk about that double-edged sword, you know, if, if we did issue and said, okay, no more flaring, that would stop a lot of the production and a lot of the drilling moving forward. And as, as we evolve out of this COVID thing and, and supply, you know, diminishes, if that were to occur and demand increases, what happens to pricing? So you're going to have the public and whenever we get on the flip side of COVID and, and if that was in, what are they going to be, what are they going to be saying then? Mm-hmm. You know, well, you did a great job of making me pay $5 a gallon for gas. Yeah. So when I talk about a double-edged sword, that's that's kind of what I'm talking about. You know, um, flaring really is uh, is something that that I think that I think we've done a great job of keeping up with. The problem is is that it, it, it's economics. You know, my my opponent says that we need to take that gas and turn it into electricity there for the wellhead, and whatever excess gas that is, we need to put it on the grid and sell it as electricity. Those, those are all good points, except for, for a couple of things that's being missed there and not spoken about, which is, you know, pretty good about the extreme leftist side. Number one, there's no way that that production, whenever you first drill that hole, is going to take all that gas and use it for elect- the small electrical requirements on there. And I will say that, that our oil field today, especially in your bigger industry players, they're, they're using renewable energy technology to help power that today. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's just better economics for them. <clears throat> but when you, when you look at trying to put that infrastructure in, economics don't work. And then you say, okay, well, let's, we're going to run electrical lines out there. Uh, that's a PUC issue, Public Utilities Commission. Mm-hmm. Public Utility Commission just doesn't let you run a power line somewhere. <laughs> that's a very confiscated comp complicated system whenever you talk about the electrical grid yeah 
And the way it is set up today, the electrical grid is mandated that we have to allow wind energy first on the grid, uh, and, and then fossil fuels is allowed onto the grid. So what I'm saying is, is when the wind's blowing, however many wind generators are out there, they get priority onto that grid, which causes some of our natural gas plants to have to shut down to allow that electricity to get on there. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. So I think it's impossible today, to, to be honest, to even get the, the infrastructure set up to turn that to electricity, not to mention what it would cost to put a power generation plant at each one of these low, uh, well locations to turn that into electricity. Yeah. Economics don't work. Have you heard of a company called Crusoe Energy? Yes, I have. So I, I think it's really interesting. You know, this company's raised, I think, $70 million mm-hmm. to turn wasted uh, flare gas into, or natural gas, into um, powering data centers and, yeah. you know, selling computing power and mining Bitcoin and things of that nature. And so I think that those are really interesting as well. You know, the, the point that you make is 100%, you know, it's like, okay, even if you generate this electricity, how do you get it back into the grid? How do you do it at scale and make it economical? But I think that it's interesting to look at things such as um, having remote data centers and um, turning that into into fuel for them. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more as long as the economics works mm-hmm. and it's not a tax subsidized uh, industry mm-hmm. like your wind industry and your solar power and your batteries are today. When when in reality the we subsidize that industry and we do that. And what the government tells us, you know, I'll put this as layman in as, a, as I can, is if we want to protect our environment, you're going to have to essentially pay more. So we're going to offer these subsidies. And if you, if you use it, California as an example, you, you guys have heard about the blackouts, right? Yeah. Same thing there that, you know, they have to allow, allow their solar and their wind energy priority on that grid. Well, they, they've done that for so long now that power plants are, are, to the point of not really having any initiative to start back up again whenever wind or sun goes away. So you have rolling blackouts. That's yeah. what causes that. And, and then your and differential I, I, price on nat gas going into California, yeah. I think it was like at a six uh, yeah. plus six spread. Oof, that's exactly that, right. Yeah. You know, and so you're looking at consumers in California today that are starting to question this, like, why am I paying so much more for my electricity here when I'm not getting half the service that the rest of our nation is? You know, I'm not against renewable. I'm all for renewable energy, but it has to make economic sense and it has to be good for us, the consumer. Mm-hmm. And, and we also have to, to, you know, and I'm okay with paying a little bit more if we can protect the environment. But, you know, there's no facts out right now that people even know about what renewable energy and solar power and wind really does to our environment. I'm t- I can tell you, I think they harm our environment worse than our natural gas problems are today. But going back to that flaring issue that we were talking about earlier, I think as a railroad commission, we need to look at maybe decreasing rules on gathering that gas. And when I say de- decreasing, making where that that infrastructure is kept up with production. And the only way to do that is make it, make it economical. So we're going to have to look at those rules and maybe lessen those rules a little bit, keep in place the environmental and safety aspects, but maybe redoing what the pipe's made out of, whatever it, whatever it takes to get it to transmission, to get it turned into cash. Again, there there's not a there's not a, a producer out there that wants to burn their gas off in the atmosphere. It's yeah. just like burning cash. The problem yeah. is, is infrastructure and production don't necessarily stay neck and neck. Yeah. So you know when we talk about impact on the environment, you know those are the facts and the education that I talked about earlier. You know I'll, I'll take solar panels for instance, and I'll, and I'll try to be simple with it. Uh, have you guys ever been past a huge solar farm anywhere? Yeah. Mm-hmm. How much grass you see growing underneath them? None. Did you know that solar, wind energy, and battery is not regulated by by any of the regulations as far as environmental that the fossil fuel is? They're exempt. No, I didn't know that. So what makes solar panels really efficient? Is the lithium? L- lack of regulation. <laughs> no. If they're dirty, they're not efficient. So they constantly have to be clean. If you don't have an environmental regulation, what are you going to use to clean them with? The most harsh detergent that you can. Brake cleaner. <laughs> that keeps them clean for the longest period that you can, correct? So I was saying it's lack of regulation so, that allows it to be efficient yeah. because so you can you do things see, like that. Yeah, right. So when you don't see gas or grass growing underneath them, there's a problem there. But they're mm-hmm. not required to go out and test that soil. They're not required to do run-on, run-off controls like we, the industry, are. Yeah. Wind generation. You guys are young. 
uh, what are y'all, you know, 30s or so? Yeah, 30. Yeah. Well, back when I was a kid, this time of year especially, it was nothing to see, just see flocks and flocks of geese that would head south for the winter. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. How many flocks of geese you see today? None. I don't think I've ever seen a I was thinking geese about that the other adult. day. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Because, like, when I lived in Lubbock, I'd see geese all the time flying through, and then you don't see them anymore. Yeah. And, you know, I think even today we're, we're kind of having a northern blow through, right? So you got cold air that's overtaking hot air, and what that causes is thermals, and, and you'll have a high rise in what's called a thermal. And you see a lot of buzzards, especially down in South Texas where I was from. Yeah. They would catch those thermals and ride them way up in the sky, you know, just flocks and herds of them. Mm-hmm. I never see that anymore either, you know, but there's reasons for that. 